Patrick Moore talks to Geoffrey Perry, the school physics teacher whose pupils became world-renowned satellite trackers. Time after time, they embarrassed the Russians and amazed the Americans with their revelations about the Soviet space program. The Kettering Connection. Patrick Moore speaking to you from the Space Satellite Tracking Station deep in the heart of England. That noise you can hear was recorded on the 16th of May 1960. And it's the voice of Sputnik 4, the Russian satellite which was then orbiting the Earth. Now that recording led directly to a series of important discoveries which dramatically increased our general knowledge about the Russian space program over a period of 25 years. And very often, those brilliant pieces of observation and the scientific deduction captured the headlines and, I might add, the imagination of the whole world. So, where am I? Deep underground in some impregnable silo? No, I'm not. I'm in Kettering in Northamptonshire, in Geoffrey Perry's study. Geoffrey, what were you doing on the 16th of May, 1960? Well, at half past four in the morning, I was standing outside Kettering Grammar School trying to see Sputnik 4 go across the sky. And I failed, but Derek Slater was inside on the top floor with his radio and he picked up the signals, he opened the window and shouted something like, I've got it! So I forgot all about looking for it and dashed in and there were those bleeps and at the first time of trying we were successful. What do you think uh, was the public awareness in those days? Not very much outside your Sky at Night <laughs> programme. Um, the local paper managed the headline, local men follow spaceship, conjuring up visions of us up there, sort of chasing around at eight kilometres a second. Yeah. Well, the space age had started by then. What had occurred by 1960? We'd had three Russian satellites before then, the first Sputnik, October the 4th, 1957. We'd had Sputnik 2 with the dog Laika, and Sputnik 3, which was an orbiting geophysical laboratory. And then in 1959, the Russians had three shots at the moon. They missed it, they hit it, they went round the back and photographed the hidden side. The Americans by this time also had launched about 19 satellites and had four unsuccessful shots at the moon. What was your job at Kettering Grammar School as it was then? I, w I was head of physics and Derek was head of chemistry. And uh, when he came to the school in 1958, with his radio, I realised that he had the means to let me listen to the things that I was looking at at night. So you teamed up and made a kind of group out of it? Well, it was just two people's hobby, and uh, the group has gradually evolved over the years until it now runs me. <laughs> Did you need any kind of a licence or official permission? It's funny that, because we had a letter from the Home Office asking us if we had a licence to receive satellite signals. Had you? No, but they pointed out that if we had an ordinary broadcast receiving license, they could endorse it to give us permission. What's your own background, Jeffrey? What really drew you to this kind of research? I suppose it was V2s dropping around us in Essex at the end of the war, being given Arthur Clarke's conquest of space for a Christmas present, and realising that with the International Geophysical Year, there would probably be questions on it in the Oxbridge Scholarship Examinations. So I decided I'd better find out about the IGY and in that the Americans and the Russians both said they would launch satellites. So I was more or less prepared for it when it happened. Well, we've been able to talk to some of the original members of your group. There were schoolboys then, people like Bob Christie. There's some fairly strict rules. Uh, satellite tracking was a lunchtime activity and occasionally out of school at weekends or maybe a little bit after school. Um, one fortunate thing was that um, the Russians, or the spacecraft that we were tracking, tended to be launched in the middle of the day, our time, because it was the middle of the day Russian time, and they wanted them over certain parts of the Earth at certain times of the day. So, in fact, we could get away with most of the tracking during normal school hours without uh, disrupting things too much. We had a regular watch for one and a half hours, which was the duration of the lunch hour, and it also guaranteed that if there was a new satellite in orbit, we would receive it, because it had uh, a one and a half hour orbital period. I think the great thing, the educational value of this, was that 
by inviting them to help me with my hobby, they were being unconsciously taught scientific method. If you say to a British schoolboy, sit down lad, I'll teach you scientific method, you'll say, over my dead body, I want to go and play football. You say, come and help me track satellites. Then they come, you see, and over the years, they learn the patience of taking uh, readings, of recording that data systematically, of analysing it, formulating hypotheses to try and explain what they're hearing. When they've got a hypothesis, they try to predict from that hypothesis what should happen. They test it. If it happens, good. If it doesn't happen, you go back and modify it. And then eventually you publish it. And that is what the whole of scientific method is about. And they unconsciously learn that over a period of years. Well, was there anything special about them? Well, we selected them with certain criteria in mind. They had to be good academically, they had some mathematical background, potentially sixth form candidates proceeding to do science at university. One of the prime qualifications, I suppose, was that they had to stay to school dinner. <laughs> <laughs> did they initiate programmes on their own, or did they have to depend upon you and Derek for guidance all the time? Um, largely, they were given their projects and told what to do. Bob Christie himself made a special study of the Russian lunar programs and the Zon program, uh, sort of forecasting when launches would take place. He had probably one of the best understandings of the Soviet program of any of the pupils that we've had. Um, the others, you don't really expect 13-year-old lads to initiate projects of their own. David Dean, who was doing Russian for O-level, worked from the time that he was 11 until he left at 18. In fact, David made a study of the voice recordings from the Salyut space stations. The cosmonauts used to read back strings of numbers, which they called Form 2 and Form 3. And David was able to match some of these numbers to things like atmospheric pressure, temperature, and also the form three was the biomedical stuff, heart rate and things like that. Well, what was your first really big scoop? When did you really hit the headlines? Was it in the mid-1960s, wasn't it? Yes, in 1966 the Russians started to use a new launch site in the Arctic Circle. And we realised this the day they actually launched Cosmos 112. We wrote about it to Flight International in April, saying that a new site was being used. Later that year, by a satellite flying on a different track, we were able to see where the two tracks crossed and were able to pinpoint the location, place 200 miles south of Archangel. Again, we wrote to Flight International, Nobody seemed to pay much attention apart from Charles Sheldon in the United States. Who was he? Charles Sheldon was in the Library of Congress and he wanted to write about the Soviet space program in a congressional study. But he couldn't talk about this launch site because it was classified in the United States. And so he tipped off the British press that they should really see what the people at Kettering Grammar School were writing about in Flight International. And just the day after we broke up for the Christmas holidays in 1966, there it was on the Times, schoolboys discover Russian launch site from our Washington correspondent. <laughs> how, in fact, did you do it? Simply by sitting in the Kettering Grammar School and listening to signals, how did you get the launch site? By calculating from the orbital data which the Russians had announced, calculating where the track was. We can do that by measuring this Doppler shift, the frequency change. And from the rate at which it changes, we can measure the slant range to the satellite. And that's what exactly the Doppler effect? You're not, not everyone will know. Well, the Doppler effect is the change in frequency. You hear it when motor cars go by at race meetings. The frequency goes... Mm. But with a satellite, instead of dropping a tone, it drops a whole octave. And then by applying Pythagoras' theorem and assuming a flat Earth <laughs> and a bit of Euclidean geometry, you can draw a track with a sufficiently broad felt pen... Uh, to allow for the errors that might be in it and where well, you get two lines crossing there's a fair chance that that's where the site was. In fact in 1967 
with the launch of Cosmos 144, one of the first operational weather satellites, we had yet another track which went through the same place. And three lines going through one place, there's not much doubt. You were actually picking up information that the Americans regarded as classified. I think you'll find that the authorities, American, Britain, Russian, they'll classify anything at the drop of a hat. And one of the values of our operation has been that we've been able to get them to become open about things which are essentially non-sensitive. The Russians knew what we were doing. They um, didn't encourage us, but they didn't discourage us. The Americans actively encouraged us by Charles Sheldon asking me to cooperate with him in the writing of these reports. And when he unfortunately died of cancer in 1981, I was asked if I would help to continue his work. And I'm now doing that with Marsha Smith, who succeeded him there in the library. She is now the specialist in space and transportation in the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress. In terms of contributing to the studies of the Congressional Research Service, for which I work, the Kettering Group data has been extremely important and leading to a better understanding in the unclassified domain of what the Soviets have been doing. There are other individuals who followed the Soviet space program as a hobby, perhaps, but there are none that would rank in the same category as the Kettering Group. But when she was asked if the Kettering results had made people in the United States raise their eyebrows and say, but we didn't know that, she said, has it made people say that? Of course. No, Whether or not there are people in or outside of government agencies, I'm not willing to comment on. Which I find highly significant. We've been talking about the Kettering Group, which uh, you and Derek actually founded. But it became international quite quickly, didn't it? Yes, it became international in 1966. By this time I had involved girls from the high school and boys from the grammar school. And Sven Gran, who was a Swedish schoolboy, age 16, wrote to me from Stockholm, sent me a tape recording saying he thought that I was the person who was most likely to tell him if what he'd recorded was a satellite. Not the best person, but the person who was most likely to answer his letter. Right. I read about Jeff in Flight International, you know, a British aviation magazine, and that he was tracking satellites. I was trying to do the same myself, but it never succeeded. Well, one day I picked up some signals. I thought, these must be from a um, Soviet satellite. So I sent a tape to Jeff, and, uh, and you know, I just addressed it to the Kettering Boys School, or Grammar School it was in these days. I said, is this a satellite? It was back in 66, and he replied, yes, it is. Keep tracking. <laughs> That's basically how it all started. And Sven, in fact, is a very professional space scientist now because he was the satellite manager for the Swedish satellite Viking, which is going to be launched, pick a back with spot on Ariane later this year is now project manager for the Nordic communication satellite Teleax. Quite honestly, every, every young man needs a mentor, and Jeff has been that to me, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, encouraging me all, all the way, certainly. And what, I've, what we've done together has been of immense value to my, you know, to my career as a uh, space engineer. What about the others, oh, Dick Flagg and Mark Severance, people like that? Mark Severance uh, joined wrote to us as a schoolboy of 16 and last summer graduated from the Southern Methodist University with a degree in physics and Russian and he's now working as a flight controller and mission controller at Houston for McDonnell Douglas. I think Mr. Perry's whole motivation was to teach uh, his students the methods of scientific research. It's certainly taught me that. I think it's uh, been a very very directive force in my career and in a sense it's made my career. It is essentially uh, molded my interest in physics and electrical engineering, which were my majors at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. It's taught me to have an unswerving respect for the facts and not to jump to any conclusions. And with that in mind, you can say an awful lot and draw an awful lot of good conclusions. I have a very high phone bill. It's probably the one bad thing that's come out of this. <laughs> Astronomical phone bills, no pun intended. He phoned me the other day to say that he'd done his first parabolic zero-g flight in a C-35. And he's the first member of the Kettering group actually to go weightless. Dick Flagg had a group in Florida that were listening to Russian satellites rather than the way that we were. Tracking satellites can be kind of a lonely hobby if you're doing it all by yourself and, and you certainly seek out other people that have the same interests. I was 17 when I first started tracking satellites. I was on the 4th of October, 1957, with the launch of Sputnik 1. And at the time, it was difficult for me even to know where the satellite was in its orbit. I knew where it was within a half hour. I was doing good. I first heard about Jeff and the Kettering Group uh, 
to an article that I read in one of the journals that he had published on Doppler shift, and that was in the late 1960s. I wrote to Jeff and told him what I'd been doing, and I've been corresponding to him ever since. Flag actually picked up the signals, the voice signals from Vladimir Komarov talking to a tracking ship in Havana, calling them, saying he can hear them excellently, but he's not getting a reply for them at all, and he sounds quite brassed off actually towards the end. Later, of course, Komarov was killed at one of the great tragedies of space research. You didn't pick him up on that on that flight? No, I slept up to school that night. We had three receivers on three frequencies and we didn't get anything. And then the next morning was the tragic news that he died. He was testing the first Soyuz spacecraft, the Soyuz spacecraft which is used today to take Russian cosmonauts to the Salyut space station. And apparently, in re-entering, the parachute shrouds got tangled. The parachute didn't open properly and the capsule just hit the ground with an almighty bump and made a big dent in the ground. What they call the dreaded Roman candle. Only the only time this happened as far as I know. And then there was one more ghastly tragedy involving three Russian cosmonauts, Dobrovolsky, Volkov and Pat Saev, and uh, one of your pupils, Bob Christie, actually tracked the launch of that. I've got one sort of personal success story that I'm reasonably proud of. In uh, 1971, after I'd actually left the school, I kept contact with the group. And uh, during half-term holiday, I was going into the school at an early hour, sort of six o'clock in the morning, and listening on the radio frequency that Salyut was using. And suddenly one morning it was transmitting. So I went in the following morning, listened at the same time, thought I got Salyut, and in fact I got Soyuz 11 going into orbit. So uh, I think I can just claim that I'm the first member of the Kettering group actually to attract a Soyuz as it went into orbit to visit a Salyut station. While acting on Bob's information, we announced to the world that the Russians had launched men to the Salyut space station. This was their first orbital space station. But I've got the log here. He picked up signals 050515. That's GMT, so it would have been five past six in the morning. Weak but very clear. Three-man telemetry. This was the 6th of June, 1971. And so far as we know, Bob Christie was the only person to get the launch of that particular spacecraft. Well, he was the only person outside the intelligence communities who picked that one up. And then we had, of course, the tragedy at the end, 23 days later, when we listened for a recovery at night and heard no signals. And so we left the recorder on a time switch. At half past six the next morning, the phone went, and I staggered downstairs. Michael Jeffries from the Evening Standard said, Have you heard the news? I said, Are they down? He said, Yes, and they're dead. Why? So I thought momentarily and said, Depressurization. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, I just sort of guessed that that was probably the only thing that it could be, because if it had crashed, then the Russians would have said that they crashed. But as the day went by, I began to think if it was depressurization, then the signal from the spacecraft should have told the Russians that the atmosphere had gone. Uh, nothing was said. People started speculating that the human body couldn't stand 23 days in orbit. Then later they did announce that they died of pulmonary embolism due to depressurization. And it was a, it was a real shock. I think people were getting rather blase about space travel at that stage. It was a, a reminder that space travel is a very dangerous operation. That's right. I mean, we felt we'd lost friends. Although we never met them personally, we'd listened to their telemetry for 23 days. And uh, it was a very sad, sad event indeed. And 
those were the last signals from Soyuz 11. They ceased when the capsule separated from the remainder of the spacecraft, and that was the instant when the depressurization occurred, leading to the death of the three cosmonauts. So by the end of the 1960s, the work at Kettering Grammar School was being taken very seriously indeed. Well, in the early days of the space program, the Russians used to wait four or five orbits, which is getting on for six or seven hours before they would announce that they had men in orbit. But with announcements from Kettering, like Bob Christie's announcement of the launch of Soyuz 11, before the spacecraft had even left the Soviet Union, telling Reuters, Reuters in London phoning Reuters in Moscow, Reuters in Moscow asking TASS, TASS denying all knowledge of it, it must have been embarrassing for them. And nowadays, of course, they will announce a manned spacecraft launch within about an hour of it leaving the ground. That's still after us. Looking back over all these years of research, what do you think was the greatest achievement of the Kettering Group? Unraveling the navigation satellite telemetry with Chris Wood. There are 50 bits of information each second coming back as this sort of jingle bell signal. Now, you can turn those jingle bells into three tones, three, five, and seven kilohertz. And you can assign noughts and ones for binary code to that. And Chris, with a little help from me, was able to show that in two minutes you got 6,000 bits of information, which give you Moscow standard time every second, the position of the satellite at three minute intervals, and the status of all the other operational satellites in their navigation system. But as time has gone by, we've developed the experience to crack several of the Russian telemetry codes. And, of course, we've learned a fair amount of Russian listening to the cosmonauts talking. Well, let's come on now to the Prince of Wales Award. That was at the Science Museum, wasn't it? What was the citation, Geoffrey? It was for their remarkable achievements during 1983. We announced that Cosmos 1402 was in trouble with its nuclear reactor and posed a threat. And Jan Ola Dahlberg, another one of our Swedish colleagues, was picking up the transmissions and noticed that over a period of three days, they became progressively weaker and weaker. And because of the British Post Office closing down over New Year, we didn't get our radar data from the United States until about the 5th of January. How typical. And when I got the radar data, I could see that not only had it split into parts, but it hadn't moved to the safe orbit at a thousand kilometers. And I realized we've got another Cosmos 954 on our hands with a nuclear reactor which was going to uh, burn up in the atmosphere. Uh, we actually, during the time that that was decaying, we were providing information to the Northamptonshire police of periods during the day when there was a problem, possibly over Northamptonshire, and Sven was doing the same for the Swedish authorities. Later that year, we announced that one of the Soyuz spacecraft had failed to dock with the Salyuk space station. Uh, later that year, when uh, people said that the Soviet cosmonauts were in jeopardy and had only two days to live, we denied that vehemently because we heard them laughing and joking. In fact, uh, one of the wives of the cosmonauts worked in mission control and instead of using normal call-up procedure, he used to say, Natasha. And they were, they were laughing. There was no way that they were in trouble. Incidentally, uh, in 1983, 17 years after we pinpointed the location of the third Russian launch site in the Arctic Circle, near the town of Plzetsk, the Russians at last admitted its existence with an article about it in Pravda. One thing I find very interesting, that the members of the Kettering group got to know each other very well without actually meeting each other very often. And I gather that after that award ceremony, some of you actually met face to face for the first time. That's right. There were people there who had heard of each other but had never actually met. Well, there were 21 of us there that night. It was the largest and smartest ever gathering, I suppose, of the group. Well, Geoffrey, you retired now from Kettering, boys' school as it is now, and uh, the project there has come to an end. Do you regret that? Not really. I think that any teacher should have his own project, and I'm sure that my successors at the school 
will have their own ways of motivating children. The Kettering Group, however, hasn't closed. The adults around the world are still keeping an ear on the Russian and the American and the Chinese satellites. You know, it's amazing too how many satellites there are now going around the Earth. I was observing a variable star the other night and I had about a degree field on my 15-inch reflector. And over a period of 10 minutes, the time it took me to get that estimate, I think I saw five satellites crawl across the field. I have no idea what they were. No, I don't suppose anybody else has either. There are about 4,500 pieces in orbit, various sizes, but um, on a clear night, starry night, just after sunset, if you go out and look at the sky, you'll see something which looks like a star slowly moving across the sky, and that will be a satellite, but uh, don't write to me to ask me what it is, because... It's a very difficult problem to identify. Um, I think some people don't realize how many transmitting satellites there are. Let's see, Jeffrey, if you can pick up a satellite. Uh, yes, there should be a, a Russian Cosmos navigation satellite there. We should be able to listen to Cosmos 1513. Right, tune in to Cosmos 1513. Let's hear what it sounds like. That signal we've been receiving on a scanning receiver, an AOR 2001, good Japanese technology, but as you can see, with a small preamp and a couple of batteries and a 60 centimeter whip antenna, you can pull in navigation satellites, weather satellites, and Russian voice. Where was it exactly? It was actually tracking down from north to south, probably over Warsaw at the time that we heard it. What height is it? It's a thousand kilometres high. Well, Jeffrey, you've done magnificent work now since almost the start of the space age. You've made great advances, you've interested a lot of people, you've made real contributions. And this is the tribute paid to you by one of our leading space experts, Jeffrey Pardo. Although space is such a vast enterprise, it's a domain in which there's plenty of opportunity at the small end of the scale. And this really was the small end of the scale, and yet look at the enormous value and interest which has been generated and the reputation of those people around the world. But it really drives home the fact that there's a very wide spectrum of opportunity and they found a niche and they've developed that niche.